اشرقت نفسي بنور من فؤادي حينما رددت يا رب العباد وانتشت روحي وصار الدمع يجري يا الهي السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته. My name is Baba Tunde Abdul Ghani Adigmidi. I work as the business development manager at Lotus Capital Limited. So, what were your goals for the beginning of this year? You know, there are a lot of people who set goals at the beginning of the year. Some can be achieved, some they cannot be achieved. But do not forget that goals are supposed to be smarter, meaning specific, measurable achievable, relatable, timely, and the ER now is evaluatable and reviewable. Something after you have gone through the smart, you need to go back and evaluate if it's working. If it's not working, you review and start again. So the goals you had at the beginning of the year, were you able to achieve them? Did you save more than you earned? Your mortgage, has it coming along? Or your rent, yes. Were you able to pay your rent with ease? The school fee, the children's school fees, how is that coming along? Have you been able to save to cater for all your needs? The key thing in all of this is financial discipline. Once you are disciplined financially, you are able to do what you want to do, what you said you will do, when you will do it about your finances, then you'll be on the right track. But do not forget that it is essential to understand the difference between savings and investment. When you're saving, you're putting money aside, and it's exactly what you put aside you will meet. For example, if you put aside 10,000 Naira every month, by the end of month, then you're going to have 100,000 Naira. Meanwhile, if you invest 10,000 Naira every month, by the end of month 10, you have 100,000 plus X, X meaning the profit. But your investment or your savings must be done in a halal way as Muslims. So let me ask you a question. Just like we have seen during this lockdown of COVID-19, if for any reason you had to stop working, if for any reason you had to stop working, either a loss of job or for any reason whatsoever you had to stop working, how long can you survive? How long can you survive? Now let's go to financial um, independence or discipline, yes. To start investing, you know, earlier I said there's a difference between saving and investing. And investing is actually the ideal because it makes your money work for you in a halal way. Now, if you have to start investing, there are certain things you need to look at. First of all, what is your financial situation? You need to be real with yourself. You need to be factual. Don't lie to yourself. Where exactly are you financially? That can help you determine your next step to take. Now, after you know where you are financially, then you need to understand the difference between assets and liabilities. Assets are those things that brings money into your pocket. In, in personal finance, when you say assets, you refer to anything that can bring money into your pocket. And when you say liability, are those things that take money out of your pocket. Those things that involve expenses that take money out of your pocket. So you, need to, you want to look at your assets and your liabilities. And you want to focus more on creating more assets. Things that will bring money to you than those things that will take money away from you. After that, then you need to understand, in, in trying to understand or focusing more on your assets, then you need to understand the difference between needs and wants. So a lot of us, we focus more on our wants instead of our needs. So you see, the needs are those things that are very germane, they are important, that without them, life may be at a standstill. You know? But wants are those things that whether you do them or not, life goes on. For example, if you want to pay your child's school fee, that is a need compared to you have to buy the shoe for that party. That is a want. Without that shoe, life goes on. But without the school fee, the educational um, legacy you're trying to build for your child ceases. You know. So understand your need from your want. After that, now your income that comes in, how do you manage it? 
how do you look at it and say this is meant for this and this is meant for this on the personal finance research has confirmed that we can split it into two 30 percent for savings and investment and 70 percent for expense now let's look at the first 70 percent 70 percent of your income 55 percent of that 70 should go into your basic needs all the expenses you need to do the school fee the house rent and you know you might ask that how will how will 55 percent take care of school fees and all that so the ideal is to for example house rent is paid on a yearly basis so for example let's say your house rent is 120,000. it means that if you divide it by 12 for a month you know how much you have to save monthly so 120,000 by 12 gives you 10,000 every month so it means on a monthly income 10,000 goes for your house rent so that's the same way you do for school fee you pay school fee per, per term and a time is like three months so you need to know in a space of three months how much would you have to save to be able to pay your school your child's school fee at the end of the third month so 55 percent for basic needs 10 percent for what you call safe to spend safe to spend safe to spend may refer to emergencies things you didn't plan for at the beginning and you know it's just an emergency and it comes if you have put something aside to prepare for exigencies emergency then you will not be caught on unawares then the last one the five percent is for charity charity remaining five percent is for charity meaning you have to be able to give you know give out give to people and either your really distant relatives or the masjid around you just give don't forget that there's a sound that did that say the hand that gives never lacks then going back to the 30 percent now we have taken care of the 70 minute where we said 55 for basic needs 10 for safe to spend and five for charity now for the 30 percent which is the investing now you break that into three as well 10 percent for what we call long-term investment in the pigeon balance we say see don't look investment something you want to put away for a long time and you don't want to touch another 10 percent for your education educate yourself is you want to go for your mba you want to buy books you want to go for seminar anything that can educate yourself another 10 percent for that then the final 10 percent should be for short-term investment again short-term investments are those things that you, do, you know where you can put money and within a short period you can quickly turn it over something liquid that you can quickly get when you need it so you see that the first thing we are saying is long term it's something you want to put away for a very long time 5 10 15 years you don't want to touch it the other 10 percent is for your education and the last 10 percent is for short term short term meaning along the line maybe you are building a house and you need some money to complete the project you can go to your short term investment so that's you you have it there you have it your income should be 70 30 the first 70 55 10 safe to spend and five for charity and the next 30 on that in investment 10 for long-term investment another 10 for short-term investment and another 10 for your education financial literacy is very very important finance is separate but financial literacy understanding finance and how to manage your finance is another very important aspect that we should understand as Muslims and as individuals. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. One of the activities of the Dawa Institute is the Dawa Grassroots Program, and we are here to meet with the director. Come along with me. I am here with me, the director of the Dawa Grassroots Program. Um, I would like you to tell us what are the activities of the Dawa Grassroots Program. As Inshallah. The Dawa Grassroots Program, you may interest you to know, is the first program of the IVT. It, it was established. And that is to see to it that, that those that were not fortunate enough to get the needed basic knowledge of Islam, especially those that have to do with worship, how a Muslim is supposed to carry out his uh, daily uh, rites of worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that was part of why 
IET open inspection, it was felt that people should uh, start going to the villages in groups to educate people. And that has carried on till today. Mashallah, well done. Um, how do you manage language barrier? If it is in the north, that's why our materials are uh, two. Because majority of the places where we carry out these our grassroots programs are in the north. Uh, and uh, therefore, we make sure that we have books that are written in house. Uh, virtually every part of uh, the north, you have people who are able to uh, read and understand or speak Hausa. So Hausa is what is used there. Then other parts of the country, we use English. But in places where, like Yoruba land, where you have a situation where people don't are not able to read English, the people, the people who go and do da'wah, do it in Yoruba language. Mashallah, man, I love the Barakana. Thank, well, thank you for your time. Thank you, thank you very much. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen. Wa salatu wa salam ala Rasulihi al Kareem. Muhammad al Amin wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Brothers and sisters and listeners, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. My name is Mas'ud Balogo and I'm Company Secretary of Lotus Capital Limited. Uh, today I'll be talking to us about what makes Islamic finance special. I believe most of us would at one point or the other have heard about the concept of Islamic finance. Uh, perhaps some of us know what Islamic finance is about. Perhaps others do not know what Islamic finance is about. And we keep getting this question, what is it about Islamic finance? Why is Islamic finance special? So are we talking us through the principles and concept of Islamic finance and why it is special or different from other form of financing. First of all, as the name portends, is Islamic. Means that the origin of that form of financing is rooted deeply in Islam and in Sharia principles. In simple terms, it just means a form of financing that abide with Islamic or Sharia principle. Uh, we should state at the outset that both concepts are important, Islamic and financing, which means that uh, all the principles of financing that we see in our day-to-day -day affairs, in our conventional spheres, would also be applicable to Islamic finance. It is just that the, uh, the distinguishing factor is that it is a finance conducted in accordance with Islamic principles. A uh, key among the concept of Islamic finance principle is the prohibition of interests. Uh, a number of us, or most Muslims, are familiar with the fact that interest or riba or usury is prohibited in Islam. So we ask ourselves, what is interest? And what are the Islamic injunctions against interest? Uh, if we go into the Quran, uh, if we look at the second chapter of the early Quran, in chapter 275, in a shaitan rajim, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, Alladhina ya'kuluna riba la yaqumuna illa kama yaqumu alladhi yataqabbathu shayatin min al-mas ذَلِكَ بِأَنَّهُمْ قَالُوا إِنَّمَا الْبَيْعُ مِثْلُ الرِّبَى وَأَحَلَّ اللَّهُ الْبَيْعَ وَحَرَّمُ الرِّبَى فَمَنْ جَاءَ مَوْعِدَةٌ مِنْ رَبِّهِ فَانْتَهَى فَلَهُ مَا سَلَفَ وَأَمْرُهُ إِلَى اللَّهِ uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said that the, he, he gave a similitude of those who take riba, that is interest. He said, those who consume interest cannot stand on the day of resurrection except as one stands who is being beaten by Satan into insanity. Uh, we can see how heavy the taking of interest is in the sight of Allah. 
and he compared those that take uh, interest, they will be on the day of judgment as, a, as someone who Satan has beaten into insanity. Interest is understood to mean the additional sum paid by a borrower to a lender just for borrowing the money alone. It does not matter what the the, what the borrower used the money for. It does not matter whether the borrower made a gain or lost the money altogether. It does not matter uh, the condition of granting the loan to the uh, borrower by the lender is that he pays him something on top of the principal irrespective of what happened. So this is why part of why Islamic finance is special in the sense that at the core of the principle of Islamic finance is the prohibition of interest. Islam allows us to deal with one another based on trade so we can enter into joint venture uh, and we can share profits, we can rent assets to one another and earn um, rental income from the uh, from the assets but giving loaning money to one another on the condition that there will be an extra income on top just on the basis of the loan of that money is what islam understands to be interest and it is forbidden in every form it does not matter whether it is personal loan or business loan uh we hear some people try to distinguish that uh, if it is a commercial loan, then to the extent that the person, uh, the borrower has gained some uh, income from it, then the lender is entitled to also share in that income. But the difference is that the basis of the relationship, of interest-bearing relationship, is that that, that commerce, irrespective of what uh, the borrower does with the money, irrespective of what he gains from the money, um, the borrower is bound to pay, pay a specific fixed amount to the uh, lender irrespective of what it does with the money and that is a condition of the loan. So this is what Islam frowns at. The other thing that makes Islamic finance special is its prohibition of business activities that are not Sharia compliant. So, for example, you cannot lend money to, whether commercially or non-commercially, for someone to gamble, right? You cannot lend someone money for him, for the person to sell or produce alcoholic beverages. You cannot lend uh, someone money for the person to rear or process pork. So everything that is prohibited in Islam, you cannot grant facility, whether on an individual or institutional level, you cannot grant financial support for the uh, production of that kind of a business. Another thing that is special about Islamic finance is that it is an avenue to bring more people into the financial markets. So, for example, when government is issuing treasury bills or bonds, uh, you have a section of the population, the Muslim, who are by law, by Sharia, prohibited from participating in interest-bearing instruments. Under Islamic finance, you are able to design products that allows Muslim to participate in the financial market without them compromising their faith or belief. This is one special thing about Islamic finance because this, this has only been made possible through the instrumentality of Islamic finance. A very important point to make as well is that um, Islamic finance it, is, it reflects our everyday life. So let us not begin to think that uh, Islamic finance is something that is bogey or is a bogey man that we should be afraid of. 
it recognizes our what they call malat our day-to-day -day affairs so we we buy goods we sell them we come together we invest in an enterprise and uh, we all share profits uh, in it so for example a joint stock company when you buy shares in a company that is engaged in Sharia compliant activities it is you are it, it's you are practicing Islamic finance so the scope of Islamic finance is, is quite wide so let us not be afraid of embracing it it reflects our day-to-day -day activities and it just has four or five areas that it uh, admonishes us to uh, move away from and we've mentioned some of them interests uh, bearing instruments uh, gambling adult entertainment pay -gree, alcoholic beverages so thank you very much for listening to us we hope you've benefited from the program may Allah uh, May, may Allah make it easy for us to practice and imbibe it in our day-to-day -day affairs. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah.